I was uh, reading a magazine the other day. It was one of those magazines you pick up that uh, totally nonsensical. And, uh, you know, usually you don't read them a lot, but there was a, a, a title on there that was really strange uh, that we talk about a lot. And the title was The Perfect Man. The Perfect Man. And uh, if you've been around us, this word perfect, we've, uh, we've really gone deep into because uh, the Bible says that we are to be perfect like God is perfect. How many is that definitely an annoying verse to all of you? <laughs> yeah, that's a give me a break verse. That's a, that's a give me a break verse. Be perfect. It, it doesn't even say... It does it, it uses it, it, it the, the big cojones here. It doesn't say Jesus says his father, you know, it brings in, you know, even though they're the same, it brings in the, the, the Godhead, the father, the, the, the beyond perfect. He defines perfect. You can't wrap your mind around perfect. Can you? Well, I was uh, looking at this and uh, in the article, I figured I'd take a clip for you. It talked about the perfect man. So where do you go to define the perfect man? Do you go to men? No, we go to women. So the women surveyed here, the women surveyed, I don't know if I could blow this up at all. The women surveyed here, uh, you, have, you have a man who's smart, a man who's funny. They love funny. <laughs> a man who's sensitive, a man who will beat someone up and protect them from another person while he's sensitive, a man who cooks for them. Oh, it just goes on. A man, when the phone rings, always answer it so she doesn't have to. A man who takes care of the car and puts gas in the car. A man who has a lot of money a lot of money so she can work if she wants to but when she doesn't want to work she doesn't have to uh he's six foot tall he has perfect teeth they love teeth they love smiles they uh, they 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 love teeth he's clean shaven steve it's clean shaven it's clean shaven i can't believe it it says right, I cannot believe, it. it says right here, he just got back from Aruba with a tan. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> Wait, is there, I, I think it's comical. I think it's comical, but is there a such thing as perfect manhood? Is there really something as perfect manhood? Well, the Bible says there is, and, uh, uh, I enjoy looking at a lot of versions of the Bible. I flipped this on for you. Uh, this is 25 versions of the Bible here. And uh, I look to see what word is used outside of perfect. Because that verse is one of those give me a break verses that I've used. And what I found is that God is the picture of perfection. And every word here says the word perfect. It's not like it said almost perfect, nice guy. It does. It didn't say anything. It just says perfect. And we know that Jesus was the perfect man and the perfect balance. He never sinned. He didn't have to worry about sinning less. So I did some research into this word perfect. And uh, I found out that a Catholic priest named Jerome actually fell in love with a nun. Yes. And uh, part of his uh, penance, I guess you'd call for falling in love with the nun, uh, was that he had to go to a place uh, uh, all on his own in isolation. And when he was there, he, he took the Old and New Testament and turned it into Latin. And he used the word perfect, teleos, in this uh, version here, teleos means perfect. Now it's used for perfect manhood. It's uh, used for many things, but one thing it does not mean 
what we Americans define as perfect. It means a lot of other things, but because each version of the Bible builds on previous versions, we're 700 years into this word perfect. Let me tell you what it means more than 100%. It means complete, full grown, mature, fullness, accomplished, uh, probably my favorite on the bottom, adequate to finish the purpose in which it was created for. <laughs> uh, fully fit, fully fit, meaning it fits, perfect fits. You say fits into what? Great question. But it, it, it fits. And uh, I read a book a few years ago that helped me out with this. And it was, a, it was a wonderful book called Good to Great. It was a business book. Maybe some of you heard of it uh, by Jim Collins. Very popular, popular book. And what, what Jim Collins did and his team is they took 5,000 corporations, knocked them down, public corporations, knocked them down to, uh, I believe, 1,500 corporations. And out of those 1,500, they put such strict guidelines for companies that went from good to great. And they came out with 11 companies that had one thing in common. The CEO of that company, the founder slash CEO of that company slash president had two qualities. How do I know this? Because I sat with my mentor, Bill McCartney, uh, a few years back, and he was all excited when this survey came out. And uh, Coach McLean Foley goes, Scott, do, do you see this? He's, he's very dramatic when he talks. And he goes, Scott, do you see this? I go, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And he was explaining, he goes, he goes, he goes, don't you get this? He goes, these two qualities, these two qualities is the two main qualities of Jesus Christ. And the two qualities is humility and resolve. Humility and resolve. And what we, what he was talking about is, what we define as integrity. And it is the number one quality of Jesus when you understand what the word integrity is, and it is the number one quality to live a holy life. Now, when you were 10 years old, and even if you like God or love God at that time, my guess is that your goal was not to be holy when you grew up. But it changes when we learn, when we learn, we know. And as of right now, my goal is to be holy. I want to be like Father, Abba Father, Hagios Abba, Holy Father is what it calls. And uh, I want to talk to you about this word integrity. For in my opinion, this is a new kind of brave for the Christian man. Integrity is so much more than what we label it today with our English definition and our Western, Western culture. Uh, we're going to define the world's definition of it, the Bible's definition of it. Why is it so important? We're going to talk, of course, about the model of integrity and symptoms that lack integrity because some of us walk around restless. Our lives are restless because lack of integrity. Oh, no, Scott, I pay all my taxes. I declare this. I'm good at this. I tithe here. I do all that. That's not what we're talking about. That's a part of it, but it's not what we're talking about. And lastly, we're going to talk about the antidote. We're going to spend time on this because we have found that this has been one of the most productive topics for men, especially after grace last month. And this is one of the most productive topics because it will help you in every aspect of your life, every aspect with your God, with your family, mostly with yourself, and of course, with others. So we're, we're going to get into that. The title is A New Kind of Brave, Christ-like Integrity. And A New Kind of Brave is Redefining Brave. We know what, brave, what we say brave is. We have heroes that are highly gifted that hit a home run in the bottom of the ninth, and uh, we idolize them because they happen to use their talent at a very stressful time. 
Well, integrity is very similar. Using your integrity at the most stressful times of your life is what will make you a hero like Jesus. But let's, uh, let's go to where we find the word integrity in Scripture. If we go to Job 1.1, 1, 1, it kicks off saying this. The writer says, there once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Maraz Uz. <laughs> he was blameless. Say blameless. blameless. Say yuck. Yeah. He was a man of complete integrity. Complete integrity. Complete. Double yuck. All right. He feared God. And he stayed away from evil. Now, isn't that a great that the writer of Job wrote this about Job? It's downhill from here, as you know, if you've read Job. If we go to Job 2 3, the Satan at the time comes up to the Lord in a congregation of many angels slash mini gods, whatever you want to call them in your unseen realm. Okay. And he says this, have you considered my servant Job? This is God talking to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? Now I could see Job sitting with Moses and the guys and hanging out and go, I wish he didn't say that. Have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> I wish, and they're like, no, he's bragging about you. I wish he bragged less about me. For there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God, turning away from evil. And he still holds fast. Say hold fast. Hold fast. Holds fast to his integrity. The reason we talk about the word holds fast, have you been around when you know what the word rock kazak means? Kazak. Say kazak. <sighs> You speak, you speak in Hebrew, and you know what you're saying? Be strong. Kazakh is a, 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 a word with many shades of meaning. It means strength, but it means to grab hold of that strength. Here, we're told that Job grabs hold, and he holds fast to that integrity, to that integrity. It says here about... Uh, David. So he shepherded them. This is uh, in the Psalms. He's taught, they're talking about David. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. This is David. Had, was David perfect? No. Nah. Did, did David blow it a lot? Yeah. Was he a man after God's own heart? Yeah. God calls him a man of integrity. There's only one person who blew it more than David. That was Solomon. Because he had all the wisdom, all the money. He made Bill Gates look poor. He had it all. Respect, power. And this is what God says to Solomon. As for you, if you will walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity, say integrity. integrity, integrity of heart, if you walk before me. He's giving him a conditional promise here. The Lord is saying, be with him. And it says here, it says, the Lord detests people with crooked hearts, but he delights with those with integrity. It's the Hebrew word tome. And uh, the opposite of integrity is not bad. The opposite of integrity is out of alignment, disjointed, crooked. That is the opposite of integrity. I'm trying to take you along here. Um, so we redefine what we know to be integrity. Integrity is not perfection in goodness, although it may be part of it. Integrity is not perfection in goodness, but passion for godliness. Remember we said a few weeks ago that is it possible that God is such a God of grace that 
besides what we're thinking, besides what we do, besides what we even say, all those reveal the depths of a man's heart. But God is so good that he actually judges us by our intentions. He looks for the good. He looks for the Christ in us. And he knows what we want to do. That's why a man who says, I want to love my wife more. Does he ask? Does he ask God for it? Because God will give you a supernatural way to love your wife. She could drive you crazy. You probably drive her crazy a lot more that you don't realize. But if you ask God for it, he'll do it. He wants to do it. He's waiting for you to get over crank puss, entitlement, George. And you're thinking, she should do this for me. She should do this for me. She should do this for me. My mother was like that. And the reality is, we're little boys. We like doing that a lot. I love when my wife takes I love when she has uh, dinner ready and she makes me feel special. This morning, she tapped me. She goes, you got to get up, sweetie. And I turn and go, blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> At 5, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning, I said, bless, bless it, bless it. Well, I didn't do that. I didn't do that because <clears throat> I'm not perfect. It took a while to get this body going. How about you? Yeah. So if we look at integrity's definition, it literally means the integration. Remember we said crooked, disjointed? It means the integration of one's philosophy into a rational mental substance that gives one character integrity. Who wrote that? A guy named Plato that confuses you a lot. So don't worry about that one. Here's what, it, here's what the dictionary says. To combine two or more things. Well, that doesn't sound like a whole lot. It's co to combine, to connect, to form, to create something, a part of another larger thing, to make a person or a group part of a larger group or organization. Basically, integrity is the fitting of parts. It's the in-between of those parts. The Lord tells us in 1 Thessalonians, now may the God of peace, Paul wrote it, Lord inspired, God, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Say completely. completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless. Here we see parts coming together again at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see a separation of spirit man, the Holy Spirit, the soul, and the body. So we have spirit, body, and soul. Would you give me that? Can we, can we move forward? You're, you're good with that. I wrote this on, on top of this. A, a man's integrity is not as much honesty with others, but more so honesty with himself. It's, it's, much, it's much more important than he deals with himself because he's dealing with the inner man here. He's dealing with what he believes, what is truth, what he says, and what he does. Everything in between that is called integrity. Everything, it, 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 it connects. We have the Holy Spirit. We have our spirit. And then we have the soul, the mind, the will, and emotion. We, we've done this before. Integrity is what exists in the space between a man's word and his action. Now you say, well, I've heard of integrity before. Yes, you have. And I've worked on my integrity. Yes, you have. But you've worked on it from a different perspective. And I want to give you a well-ordered man, a biblical perspective. First, there's different types of integrity. There's moral integrity. That is the one that most of us know about. It's a measurement of a man's values. It's a measurement. The word integrity is similar to character. You may say it's similar to character, but a man can have bad character, we say in our language. We don't say a man has bad integrity. We say a man lacks integrity. You see, integrity is a good thing. 
Moral integrity is what most of us know about, and that has to do with our values. It means right and wrong, okay? And the man who does more right is considered more integral. There's, there, his parts are moving inward. Financial integrity. This is a measure of a man's priorities. Financial integrity is the stewardship of what God gives us in our monies. Do we feel that uh, 90% of what we make is ours and 10% is God's? We talk about tithing. I love when people say the New Testament doesn't talk about tithing. I go, well, Jesus does. <laughs> Jesus does, and he says it's important, and, and, and continue it. Today, 5% of the Christians tithe. 5%. 5% of the Christians in church, born again Christians in church, tithe. Pastor, say amen. I don't know if got that. Yeah. Yeah. 5% of the Christians. They may give, but 5% of the Christians tithe. You know, God says, here's your integrity. For every dollar you make, give me 10 cents, save 10 cents. And live below your means. And the adage is, if you can't live on 80% of your money, you ain't going to live on 100% of your money. That's called financial integrity. That's called financial. We live in a very wild society. The richest civilization in the history of the world. Richest civilization. The man who has high financial integrity, it's not the man that gives a lot. It's the man who gives percentage of. Jesus, again, they say he didn't talk about tithing. Gee, I don't know why they say that, because he did. Jesus says, you see that woman? The widow's might, it's called. Jesus and God is into percentages. He's sitting there with a pencil in his ear, and he's sitting over there. Now, he's not judging you because of grace, but he knows what will work better in your life. That widow was looked upon greater than the folks over there who gave 100,000 than the woman who gave her Michael. She gave a greater percentage of what she had. Turn to the man next to you and say, this is going to be good for you today. All right. Next is a lighter version, sexual integrity. Sexual integrity. Now, I want you to, I want you to read this. A man must not commit his body to do that which he is unwilling to do with his entire life. Sexual integrity dictates that which a man commits his body to, he must also commit his heart and mind to. That is why pornography and fantasy is wrecking men's integrity. Because what it does, it disconnects. Because there is a integrity conscience in there that says, I'm not connecting this picture I'm looking at. I can't give her on my mind. I can't give her my heart. She sure looks good. Yes, she does. Yes, she does. She looks beautiful. And that, that is true. But integrity steps in and connects truth. And truth says, that will never deliver what it's promising. It will only frustrate me. It will lead me to darkness. And it's not maybe, it does. There is so much soft porn today. That is, a, again, I, I check the sports on the post at night, the New York Post. I just check the sports sometimes before I go to sleep. I just want to see the scores. I, I, it's like a battleground trying to get in there because it's always saying this, hey, Scott, Look at the, 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 the prettiest quarterback's wives in, in football. Hey, Scott. Hey, Scott. Look what this woman looks like now that she's 87 years old. Hey, Scott. Remember this guy on the Brady Bunch? Look and see who his partner is right now. It's all dark, godless junk. You see, integrity, your sexual integrity comes when something comes on the TV David said, in uh, I believe it's the 100 or 101st Psalm, he says, I will let these eyes go for nothing worthless. I will not look upon anything worthless in my life. And we continue to put in three, four, five, six hours of TV at night and wink at God in the morning, and we can't figure out why we don't have the peace of God. Turn to the other guy, he said, it's getting better for you now. Yeah. <laughs> 
relational integrity. Uh, with some of us have been at this, and I say at this, ministry to men for over 25 years now. And uh, some of the empirical data that we have come out with is men just do not know how to be friends. They weren't taught it by their father. They, they have no idea how to be friends. It's, it's a self-centered world, even in the church. They don't know how to sacrifice for each other. I'm not saying everybody. I'm just saying, I'm just saying a lot of men have to be taught how to be friends. Social integrity is vital. Social integrity is vital. There are people who display self-centeredness, but you could just tell them on text. They text you, they get upset if you don't text them back. Okay, you text them and they don't text back. Now, texting today, unfortunately, if you're, if you're into it, I'm not talking to you, Steve. Uh, unfortunately, if you're into it, you told me to say something to him. Right? So, so, <laughs> okay. uh, fortunately, if you're into it, there's an integrity, there's an, a social integrity that you don't make people feel less than they are. You don't make people feel more than they are. You, the word is respect. The word is respect. I try to always get back to somebody within 24 hours. It's the best I can do. I can't do it all the time. Steve gets cranky when I don't, but I mean, I try. Uh, and don't you? Don't you? We try to do that, and that's okay. TJ, you're out of this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of you guys are at it. TJ, John Thomas Selling, and some of you are not in this conversation. <laughs> Yeah, don't ever get insulted. Don't ever get insulted for when you feel like you're texting and you hear this, cricket, cricket. Don't ever get insulted with that. I just wanted to bring up that point because some men don't get it. We're going to go over this. We're going to go over this. Some men don't understand what this means. They forgot what a handshake of agreement means. They forgot what it's like to say, I'll be there at 730. You see, the man who's consistently 15 minutes late, sorry, I didn't want to, I didn't see anybody walk in late. The man who's consistently 15 minutes late, consistency lacks integrity. You're disrespected. See, your promptness shows respect for a person's time. Guys, that's not in heaven. That's our culture here. Because in other cultures, it doesn't. But this culture here in the United States, you tell someone you're going to be somewhere at a certain time. And what happens if you're not? Today, even TJ hits you with a text. He's running late. You know, no, I'm serious. I mean, even guys who are not who are not into that because they're busy on beaches. But it's just you didn't think you're getting away with that, did you? Let's go. Spiritual integrity. Your spiritual integrity is a measure of a man's submission to the spirit. You want to measure your spiritual integrity? How much are you personally alone with God? Right there. We can just stop right there. How much time do you give God? Because I, I know with pastors, we can easily, we can, some of you are teachers in the room, we can easily spend a lot of time in God's word preparing to give you this. But God wants our heart. God wants our time. God wants our submission in my flesh, my desires, my dreams. I've been crucified with Christ. My dreams, my desires, what I wanted in my, for my, everything is in submission to him. Everything, the bad, the good, life's hard, period. Anyone who doesn't know that is in for a, a really rude awakening. Spiritual integrity, we'll go into that a little also. Uh, verbal integrity, which we'll go into next week, the one you love. Verbal integrity is really the measurement. Jesus says the measurement of your heart, measurement of your obedience, measurement of your love for him by what comes out of your mouth. Some guys still do, but it's usually the first thing that changes in a man when he's disciple is his language. Not because he shouldn't. I'm with guys who, you know, they'll curse and do what they have to do. And I don't, I don't, hmm, shame on you. Shame on you. I get a kick when we go out socially with guys and uh, they'll do it. And uh, they'll be in the corner. Go, oh, 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 oh. 
the, the, the guys there, shush, shush, shush. They'll do something like that, but for their own family, they won't. For their own family, they won't. Verbal integrity, uh, without a doubt, reveals the most about your complete integrity. A man's peace shrinks or expands in proportion to his integrity. If you're a man of high integrity, you walk around not perfect, not higher than everyone else. You walk around knowing that what you say, if I say I'm going to call you at 4.30, I don't have to call you at 4.30, but I do have to tell you I can't call you at 4.30 after I told you I was going to call you at 4.30. These are men who have high self-worth. They don't value the other part. They value themselves. They value their integrity. I'm telling you guys, this, if you take this and apply this to your family and your life, many things that you feel stuck with will change. Many things because only the Holy Spirit can do what we're saying here. These are just real quick definitions as we wrap up. Integrity is the tension a man feels between life's tough decisions. Integrity invites a man to choose God's truth. Integrity is the negotiator between the soul and the spirit. It is the tension that truth creates in its attempt to lead us. It's not perfection and goodness, but passion and godliness. God measures your integrity by your passion for truth. It's a man's response in truth to life circumstances. Integrity is the courage. And here we go, hold fast again. Integrity is the courage to hold fast to divine truth for his divine destiny. Uh, William Barclay says that word perfect um, commentator and uh, historian as well as a theologian, he says that word perfect means being fully adequate and fit for the call God puts on your life. I don't mean to be so teachy with you today, but we, I, we just got to get off. We, we're launching this and we're going to do this over the next few weeks because by the time Christmas comes, you're going to have a path to follow to show your family Jesus Christ in the flesh. Because our model for this is Christ. Glory is what distinguished Jesus as Lord. Integrity is what distinguished Jesus as man. <clears throat> He was full of integrity. Why? Because he knew a man's talent will always take him to a place his integrity cannot hold. That's the way life works. You're constantly pushed and challenged with your integrity. See, that's what the word perfect is about. You're constantly being perfected. You're constantly maturing. This is why we, we chose a new kind of brave. And what we're going to be speaking about is Christ's integrity. And that's where, we, that's where we always wind up because he is our perfect model. Jesus' motive was always love. He couldn't help it. He is love. He is love. As rowdy as he appeared to get, it was all in love. As aggressive as scripture may show, he smiled a lot. Doesn't say he smiled anywhere in scripture, does it? It says Jesus cracked up. Wouldn't you like that to be in scripture? Okay. But his motive was always up. His purpose was always to bless. See, love can only do that. The motive and his purpose is blessed. The words spoken were always truth. There was nothing he ever said that was a lie. Can God lie? That's impossible, or he can't remain God. Turn to me next to you, says, take that one home for you. Okay. And what I love about Jesus is that it was always effective. It was productive. It was competent. It was excellent. It brought the change of the world that he and Father God planned. It brought the change of the world. He was the perfect man using what we believe today is, is the perfect. But he was the perfect integration, perfect 
of body, soul, and spirit. And that's what we're after. And uh, we're going we're gonna to have a good time with this. And uh, let's just thank the Lord for what he's done today. Father God, we thank you. For who are we that you take time and come and anoint these words? That you may anoint how we work with our families. That you may bless those of us who need blessing. That you may give those of us with needs right now, Lord God. Lord, we know you're perfect. We ask you to lead the way and remember and help us remember your love and grace and your call to integrity in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. What a great word. Wow. Very powerful. Um, I will handle um, offering today, men. Um, Coach Carlos is actually in Dominican Republic celebrating a solid week with his family. A whole bunch of them went down there, so keep him in your prayers. And um, to cover offering, I just want to bring up, uh, Brother Sonny, if you could bring up the website, um, just to understand how you can give. For you old timers, man, you could always send a check to the ministry at our conference center at 27 Grand in Farmingdale. You could text the word GIVE to 833-500-4685, and you could always give online, right, go, right, go, to, uh, go right to uh, donate and give right there. And you always, whoever is chiming in via Zoom, you'll always get a live email um, talking about that as well. And guys, if you can, even the ones who are there live in the conference center, obviously you do your offering there. But we're going to ask that all of you consider doing something, whatever it is, put it on that God puts on your heart, pray on that number. And if you can stick to that number on a monthly basis, it would help with, uh, obviously it'll help with not only monthly costs, but it'll help just an easier way to budget guys and uh, keep that in mind. And uh, there's a multiple ways to give and thank you, bro, Sonny, for showing that. Um, and like I said, to help us keep budget, if you could keep in, in prayer, uh, that if you're being blessed here as a ministry, as a parachurch, that you would give to the ministry. So I thank you for that. Pastor, what a great word. Um,